Hey everybody, JJ here, back again with another special Wednesday edition, and I mean special Wednesday edition, because we're on at 8 o'clock in the morning in Los Angeles. Never done this before, so I'm really excited. Today's call is going to be amazing. Right now, we have the most number of people on the Zoom call that I've ever, ever had. Largest call I've ever had. I had to expand my account from 100 to 300 people to accommodate this young lady. Um, Our guest speaker today is a powerhouse. Her topic is multifamily. I saw her at a real estate seminar in Vegas. She was on stage just knocking it out of the park. I said, I got to get to meet this woman. And uh, we've now become friends. And that's, again, part of networking. But our guest speaker today is known not only nationally, but internationally. She's a powerhouse of multifamily, raising money, highly respected in every single real estate group you can imagine. And it is my honor to introduce my good friend, Vina Jetty. Vina, how are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to all of you guys for being here on a Wednesday morning. Well, we're excited to have you. Hey, um, let me ask you, for, for those that don't know you, what part of the country are you from? I'm in Dallas, Texas. And if you're in Dallas, I'm actually in Frisco, but people don't know where that is. So I just say Dallas. In Frisco, for those of you that do yeah. Dallas, Frisco, that don't know, Frisco is just north of Dallas. Yes. I have actually lived in Dallas for four years myself. I lived in Grapevine and Mesquite. Yeah. So I've gotten really spoiled living in Frisco. So now I'm like, I don't leave Frisco unless I'm going to the airport. I don't leave Frisco. And I've even gotten so spoiled. I'm like, is that on like the east side of Frisco? Because that seems a little far for me to go now. So <laughs> I'm like either in West Frisco or I'm at the airport going to whatever city I'm speaking in. Well, next. when my new house is done, I think I showed you the pictures the other day. Yes, you did. You did. I'm All excited. Right, you've got to come to the new house for the mixer. Oh, you can't stop me if you tried. Oh, great. So um, what did you do before you got into real estate, Nina? So I've actually always been in real estate my whole entire life, even before I was done with undergrad. Um, I come from a real estate family. My mom, um, she actually had a very successful real estate business. And you know, I think it's important when we're talking to people that are just starting out to kind of note that. I had a very solid foundation of real estate, but my family made their money in single family. I'm the first to invest in multifamily. And my mom, what she did was incredible because my parents were immigrants. They came here with $26. That's all they had when they came here. And they really, they worked really hard. They had a lot of grit, determination, um, and they utilized the opportunities that came to them. I'm sure there's a little bit of luck involved, but, um, you know, they utilize opportunities that came to them when a door opened, they actually walked through. And I think that the intentionality with which my parents built that foundation and then built, turn around and built it for my sister and I has just yielded so much more fruit than I think they could have ever imagined. And, you know, I hope that when my kids are, well, my kids will probably be like, oh no, we're going to sell everything and spend all the money. But my hope is that they actually, you know, follow in our footsteps, not necessarily in real estate, but by trying to do whatever it is they choose to do at the highest level and being the best at whatever it is, regardless of what their chosen path is. You know, um, and family's so important. You know, um, my mom passed away last year at 96 years of age, but we were we were close all the time. We went to Dodger games all the time. And, and when you talk about family, um, you know, those of us that are networking, we talk about how our family will be our biggest source of referral for our business. So it's important to let everybody know what we're doing within our community, uh, our family, et cetera. Um, I have only known you to be the woman on stage that everybody just goes, Oh my God, she's in the room. So, <laughs> uh, you know, what was your, did you, did you join any, like a number of us are in various education groups. A number of us have, have, uh, done training or are there any programs that you've been a part of or what's been your journey to, to get here to where yeah, you are today? So remember how I said, I'm not the smartest person in most rooms that I'm in. That includes this room because I did not join a mastermind or a mentorship or a coaching program. I, 
I was actually just telling, um, I was at a meeting right before this and I was just telling, actually, she's part of the sub community, Carolyn, who's based here. She heads up the Dallas chapter. I was telling her, I was like, yeah, you know, I'm sure there's footage of me or there's a podcast of me or me speaking somewhere where I'm like mastermind coaching. That's ridiculous. Why would anybody spend that money? And I feel like this year in the last year, I've been kind of like trying to take my foot out of my mouth now because what I realized is the power of communities like this, right? Like what Pace has built with Sub2 is incredible. And I see people asking me questions and I ask questions of the other people in the room and I'm like, oh my gosh, it it's like a light bulb went off in my brain and I'm like, I could have skipped so many mistakes I made. This was the shortcut. And I was like, no, I'm going to do it the long, slow and hard way. So let me just take 10 years to get here. Whereas if I had known today, if I know, if I had known then what I know today about the actual power and impact that just mindset and forget all the technical stuff, forget the ex- experience, just the mindset alone, it I don't know where I would be today. I mean, I assume I would be at 10X where I am. And so I think that that is easily the single biggest mistake I've ever made in my entire career, hands down. You know, um, I usually ask this question later on, but I'm going to ask it right now. Uh, With these groups and these social communities, Mm -hmm. uh, I say all the time that real estate is not a a business we can do by ourselves. It's important yeah. that we have other people. Uh, we all hear the phrase, our network is our net worth. Mm-hmm. Um, as we have a number of new investors on the call today and experienced investors, uh, but I'm always promoting the importance of networking. What do you see the importance of networking to build one's respective business? So when I was first starting out, and I know, you know, capital raising is kind of the theme, so I'll bring it a little bit back to that subject. So when I first started out, that was where, those were my capital sources. Those were the people that were going to write me a check to fund a deal. Now, it's so much more than that. Networking and, you know, networking being your net worth, it's because the mindset shift that happens when you are leveling up the people you talk to on a regular basis, you guys have all heard that like you're the average of the five people you hang around most of the time. Right. Well, like for me, it's like I have toddlers that I hang around and then, you know, I have like my husband who's not in real estate. So like the last two people in my five person average have to be very high level, right? Because they got to make up for the shortcoming my three-year-olds are bringing to the table, but no, in all seriousness, right. It's the ability to see possibilities that I never, ever, ever, ever would have thought were possible is dramatically. And even now, I don't know where I'm going to be even six months from now or a year from now. But what I do know is the people around me are constantly challenging me and forcing me to level up my thinking and my game and how I approach things. And the other power that masterminding and networking has is entrepreneurship can be kind of lonely sometimes, right? Like you're, you're raising capital on a deal and you're not getting the response you wanted, or it's slower than usual. You're worried that the deal isn't going to close, you know, any number of things, something happens surprising during due diligence. How do you handle it? You're not cash flowing, you know, whatever the reason is but you can't necessarily talk to people who are your friends or your family because they maybe are investors or potential investors. And you don't want to vent about something and then have them be like, oh, well, I don't want to invest in that deal because the whole sky is falling down. So it it becomes very isolating. It becomes very lonely to be able to talk about these things and navigate these. And then sometimes it's just, you need to get it off your chest, right? And having that network, having those people that you can come be like, I just need to say something. It has nothing to do with the deal, nothing to do with anything. I just need to get it off my chest. And then speaking about it and then hearing an outside party's perspective and insight, it is life-changing. It, I spent over 10 years carrying all the burdens that came with business by myself because I didn't 
feel safe. I didn't feel like there was someone that I could speak to, or I could discuss this with, or share this with, or be vulnerable with. And I didn't have someone who was pushing me outside of my comfort zone. So all of my growth to date was just my own inner self, my own inner fire. But if I had a networking group that was as high caliber as the people in this room today, and as curated, I would have had someone telling me I could do better, someone believing in me so that I could believe in myself. And that is just, it's life-changing. Well, I, I want to thank you for the comment there, a compliment about the power of this group. I think it's it's kind of got there in the time that we've been growing it. Um, multifamily. Yes. Raising capital for multifamily. Uh, we all want to get into multifamily. We get into this, we're told, do a rehab, do a couple rehabs, uh, you know, start with wholesaling, get some money up so you could do a rehab, do a couple rehabs yeah. and then keep one. Yeah. And then do three more and then keep the fourth and do three more and keep the fourth. And then eventually down the line, we yeah. maybe one day to hope to acquire a multifamily. Mm -hmm. So is there a way we could shortcut that or, or how does one go about just getting right into multifamily? Yeah, it's ironic because we're talking about like the power of networking and the power of these groups, but that really is the key. It's being in these rooms with other like-minded people who also want to do multifamily. So I am like the one person that I speak and I'm totally biased, right? Because I love multifamily. It's the best asset class. Um, but I also am the one that says, if I could go back and do it all over again, I would have skipped single family. I would have never done it. I wouldn't have even thought about it. And I would have gone straight for the scale and I would have gone straight to multifamily. And um, we had a mastermind here in Dallas uh, the last two days, yesterday and day before yesterday. And uh, Pace is the one who actually put it all together and hosted it. And it was amazing. As you can imagine, it was a small group. And we had this exact conversation, right? Like single family, multifamily, how do you skip? And I think he framed it really well when he said, listen, when you start here at nothing, oh, my camera is like reversed. So it's going to show up backwards when I'm trying to show you guys. Um, but when you start here and then you want to go to multifamily over here, there's a big bridge here, right? So how do you take that first step over the bridge? And he said, you know, I tell students that single family starting small is a way to kind of take that first step forward to get over to the bridge, to get over here to multifamily. For me, where I see a different perspective or a different way to kind of step forward over that bridge is finding partners that are more experienced than you, that have a need that you can fill. And listen, there it takes a lot of different skill sets to close a multifamily deal. And none of us close deals all by ourselves ever. It's just, it's not possible. It, they're too big. We need help from our teams, right? Whether it's attorneys or accountants or partners or investors or lenders, whoever it is, we need a team around us. And I think by finding the team, especially if you're looking at general partners, right? You can find the people that have complementary skill sets, or maybe they have one or two deals more than you do. And you can come and attach onto their project and bring value to their project and learn. And I think the biggest mistake people make when they go into their first deal, they focus on the dollars. They go, oh, but wait, wait, I found the deal and I'm going to raise half the capital and I'm going to operate the asset day to day. But so I should keep 50% of the deal or I want to keep 70% of the deal or whatever that is. And it's absolutely 100% the wrong way to look at it. And the reason being is the first deal is really hard because until somebody gives you the key to get that first deal done, you are not going to be able to do more deals in the future. And so what happens is that first deal is a springboard to being able to do 10, 20, 30, 50 million, $100 million deals. And without doing that first deal, you can't. And the thing people miss on that is it's not about the dollars you make on that deal. It's not about the equity you make on the deal. It's about having that first deal on your resume and your track record, that's where the key really is because that's where you're going to be able to now go and say, hey, lender, I just borrowed 
on a $5 million deal or a $10 million deal or whatever that first deal was, I'm a, I'm a GP on this asset. I'm a sponsor on this asset. I want to go and do my second deal, but this time I want to be the controlling partner. Well, guess what? If your first asset is performing and you're doing well, then you can, you'll get funding. You're, you'll be bankable and people miss that. And they get so caught up in like, oh my gosh, but I put in so much work and I'm only going to make $10,000 or $50,000 or a hundred thousand dollars or whatever that number is. And they get caught up in that and they start falling at that first, first, first step. Trust me, if you guys are in this for the long game and you're in this for the long haul, if I were do if I were in your shoes and I wanted to get in my first deal, I would say, all right, you know what? I am going to give you 90% of the deal, 80% of the deal, 70%. I don't care. Whatever you need to agree to get me in this room is what I'm willing to do. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, that's that's crucial. You know, uh, even when we're starting out with wholesaling and starting out with rehabbing, and as a new investor, we don't know anything. Uh, you know, one of the one of the big things I was told in the beginning was, you know, find the deal, find the money, bring those two things together, and to as Pace's terminology, squad up, find someone that knows more than we do. Yep. And then work with them, and don't get caught up on the money, even in the very beginning. Don't get caught up with the money. Get the deals done because as you get yeah. the deals done, you're getting your transaction, your 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 traction. It's important that we that we not get caught up with with that with how much money we're making, but to get yeah. the deals done. Now, now as you're doing, you know, multifamily. Let me ask you this question because I want to ask you what the progress was. But what type of deals are you funding now as you're raising cap? What type of deals are you are you into? Because I want to then go back to how did you get there. Yeah. Okay. You um, couple so, big deals. Yeah. So the first multifamily deal that I did, we bought it for fifteen point nine million. Um, I too had a more experienced partner because I needed somebody to open that door for me and to get me in. It's like we call it like the country club. Actually, that's what we say in the field. We say like, oh, are you in the country club? And until you're in the country club, you can't do more deals. So I had someone else who brought me into the country club. And then after that, you know, we continued to do more and more deals. Now um, we generally are buying deals with a minimum of 75 million, but um, we're transacting on deals that are over a hundred million now. Wow. Yeah. And when you started, what were some of the first multifamilies you you, you started to do that got you to where you are today? Yeah. So I, we, we're pretty bread and butter. We've kind of done the same thing, like, or some variation of the same thing with kind of a similar strategy. So we look for class B value add assets. Uh, before we were way less selective about how many units and the deal size. Now we just don't underwrite anything under 75 million. It's not in our buy box. We don't look at anything under 200 units really. Uh, so we're very particular and intentional now, but when we were first starting out, we were a little bit more open to smaller deal sizes. Um, like I said, I everybody in this room can find a partner that has done one or two more deals than they have, right? No matter how many deals that is. And I, I get a lot of people that will approach me and say like, Hey, I have this deal and I want to partner with you. And it is, you know, X amount of dollars. It's in this market that I don't transact in. It's outside of my entire buy criteria. And I always tell people, I am not the right partner for you on this deal because I don't, I can't help you operate in that space, right? Like I had somebody ask me about doing a, um, it was like a $10 million deal and it was in a market that I am not in. I don't invest in that market. I don't know anything about that market. I would be starting from scratch and it's a, a smaller asset class than we're looking at and targeting today. The problem is, is when, if I were to come in on that asset and they're like, oh, we'll give you complete control. I don't want control on that asset because I don't want to have to operate that asset. I want to focus on the assets that I'm operating because if I take 10 minutes to focus on the $10 million deal, I now am taking 10 minutes away from a $100 million deal. And the opportunity cost is just way too high for me to do that. I cannot do that. And so you want to look for somebody that's one or two or three deals ahead of you because they're still going to be able to reach back and grab you and pull you forward in a 
practical way that I'm not equipped or set up to do. I have a, a responsibility to my investors in my deal to not get distracted by another, you know, shiny object. So I'm very, very, very selective in what I do. I say no to like every deal that comes across my table. Uh, and I know it sounds like an exaggeration, but really I say no to n- over 99% of the deals that I see. So as we're starting to go into multifamily and, and you, obviously you're not swinging a hammer, you know, um, uh, you're, you're gathering the funds to make these deals happen. Mm-hmm. So as you're meeting people and you're developing relationships and they decide, Hey, you know, like myself, I would love to be a, a lender for you. And mm-hmm. whether I have enough money or not, I don't know. I've got a good little nest egg. That's another, that's another conversation. Um, yeah. Do these monies, you, you only pull these monies in once you really need them, so to speak. Um, it's not like they're putting money into an escrow account before you. And how how do you gather these funds? How are how are they staged? What's mm-hmm. what's one of those types of things? Yeah. So the, to answer your first question, we do not take in capital before we have a deal to deploy it into within ninety days. Um, the reason for that is what happens is if you raise the capital and you collect it, let's say you, JJ, you're going to write me a check for hundred K and you write, it's ironic because I do have a deal right now, but let's say I didn't have a deal right now and you write me the hundred thousand dollar check. And now I have that in my bank account. Well, let's say we multiply that. Now I have a million dollars or $10 million and my press is accruing and I'm starting to count the time of my IRR calculation from the time I take your money in. Well, now what happens is I have a lot of pressure because I won't be able to meet the same returns without deploying the capital quickly. So if it sits for a year or six months, it is going to diminish the value and you're going to, you're going to make your investors mad. It's, that's just how it is. So when you're raising capital, there's two ways to really go about it. One way would be to take funds only as you have a deal. So, okay, I'm under contract on this deal or I'm about to be under contract on this deal. I'm gonna start raising capital. Or the second way would be, I'm going to raise capital. I'm gonna get a commitment from you. I'm gonna take 5% or 10% that's non-refundable. And then I'm gonna capital call you two weeks or three weeks or a month before I have a deal. So that in six months, if I still don't have a deal, I only have 5,000 or $10,000 of yours. Now, with that, you also want to be mindful of how your deals underwrite and what you need to be looking at in that regard is how, depending on how you're raising capital, whichever of these two methods you're using, you want to make sure that you're planning for that so that you are underwriting to those deal metrics and you can make sure you're still hitting the return targets because that's the long game, right? The long game is delivering for your investors. The short game is just raising for your first deal and not meeting those return metrics, then you're done. You don't need to worry about making any relationships or networking because you're not going to do any more deals. No one is going to want to continue investing with you. Um, The second question you had asked me was, how do we collect the funds? So we actually open an entity for our investors. We have what's called a PPM document, a private placement memorandum. And the PPM document dictates everything about the deal. Uh, The SEC requires us to put it out in order to raise private capital. We put out the PPM. It has an operating agreement where every investor becomes a member of the investor LLC. And then we take that and we open a bank account for the investor LLC. And then investors will fund money or wire money to the LLC account at the bank. Wow. That's gold, guys. Uh you got to come back and take notes and watch the video over and over again. We got some questions starting to line up here, but um, one thing I hear about is accredited investors. And when you get to a certain size and depending upon how much money we're pulling in, we have to have a certain kind of a license or a certain kind of certification. Can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah. Um, well, first I'll start by saying I have zero licenses and I'm not an attorney. So Pretend like I don't know anything and always check with your own attorney. Um, Generally speaking, when we're raising capital, it's what's called a security, right? And there's something called a Howey test. The Howey test basically says, are we raising money from investors 
into a common enterprise that are expecting to primarily benefit off of the work of somebody else, which in our investor's case, the answer is going to be yes. So we are selling a security. Now, the SEC says that if you're selling a security, you need to register your security, which is a long and expensive and arduous process. But the SEC also says, well, but wait, if you're raising for these things within these parameters and these boxes, you don't have to register. You have to tell us what you're doing, but you don't have to register it. So we use what's called the Reg D, like David, Reg D 506C, like Charlie, exemption. We rely on that exemption so that we can sell an unregistered security. There are others. There's 506B, like boy. There's Reg CF, which is Reg crowdfund. Um, there's reg A, there's a reg S. So there's a, a many different ones, but the, the one that most of you are probably going to utilize is going to be the reg D 506 B or 506 C. That's going to be the vast majority of you guys. Um, so anyway, so you're, we raise on a 506 C. Um, what that means is we can raise from only accredited investors, but we can put general solicitations out to investors we don't know yet. When you're first starting out, a lot of times you'll start with a 506B, like boy, because what the SEC says is you can have as many unaccredited investors as you want, but you can have up to 35 sophisticated but unaccredited investors. And you can, but not and, but the caveat is you cannot publicly advertise or generally solicit, and you have to have a pre-existing substantive relationship with every single investor in your deal. So it's kind of the trade-off, and a good securities attorney will walk you through this and understand who you have in your network, who you're going to raise capital from, and then they're going to guide you toward which regulation or exemption you should rely on. Now, that's securities law. And this is why it's so complex and it's so important to have a really good attorney. And this should be your first call when you're raising capital. But then there's also the Investment Company Act and the Investment Advisors Act. And those also have different sets of exemptions. They're a little bit more nuanced. And usually your first deal or two deals or maybe several deals, you won't really fall under the purview because you'll have an exemption you can rely on. Um, but those are all things that your securities attorney is going to kind of make sure line up for you. So you want to make sure you're being transparent about who you're raising capital from, how you're raising capital, what you want to do with it. And the most important thing I can tell you guys is before you start raising capital, you have to have that conversation with your attorney because what can happen is maybe you start posting about your deal on Facebook, right? And it's a public post. Um, or you post in a Facebook group where you don't know every single member. It's not like your family's Facebook group, right? Well, now, if you've done that, and then you go talk to Nick, who are, Nick's our securities attorney, and you go talk to Nick, and you say, hey, Nick, um, this is what I want to do. I made a post in Facebook. Everybody's really excited about it. There's a situation where if you generally solicited, he's going to say, okay, well, now you can't use the 506B exemption. So now every investor in your deal has to be accredited and you have to rely on a 506C exemption. So it's really important that out of the gate, you're structuring the deal correctly and you understand how you should be raising that capital. That's gold. That's so. gold. Um, and, you know, obviously uh, I've, I've, I've been working for four years to build my network. Mm -hmm. And I'm now ready to go to the next level. And I'm going to be following your path. I'm going to be taking these relationships. And, you know, and, and the guy's on the call right now. You know, We were talking about it earlier before the call started. Build your network. Your network is about building your relationships. Don't chase the deal. Chase the relationship. You need to build your relationships before you need them. You know, that, that, that's just so crucial. Um, can we take a couple questions here, Vina? Absolutely, we can take all the questions. Okay, great. Gary Tartarian, each business. That's a little more meaning there for us, guys. Long. Hey, uh, you are on with Vina Jetty. What's your question? Hello. Thank you so much for doing this. First of all, guys, uh, really appreciate all the information. So um, I wanted to ask what you think the best course of action would be to raise capital on a multifamily deal. It's a 12-unit deal. Okay. Um, 
I've already ran all the numbers for it. It doesn't really work that much for a LTR, like a long term mm -hmm. rental, but it does work really well as an STR, okay. like a boutique hotel. Yep. yep. What market is it in? It's in Tempe, Arizona. Okay. Oh, I love this market. Okay. Um, Tempe, Arizona, 12 units. What's the purchase price on it? 2.55. Okay. Million. And how, how much equity do you need? One and a 1.2, 1.3? Um, how much equity do we need? Yeah, how much cash do you need to raise? Five hundred ten thousand, plus the furnishing costs. Is it is it seller financed? No, but it possibly could be. I haven't talked actually to the to the agent because it's on market right now. Okay. Um. So you're gonna finance it with debt? I'm thinking of getting private partners involved and do it in all cash yeah okay you need to then that means you need to raise the entire amount right you said 2.4 2.55 so you're gonna need to raise all two and a half million plus some right uh, you're probably looking at almost like a 2.8 million dollar raise um just a couple of notes and i know i'm going on a tangent but i think this will be helpful for you as you're underwriting the deal um, one right now, if you're getting bank debt, you're not getting above 50% leverage. I can almost guarantee it. I would bet money on it. So you're getting around 50, maybe 55%. Wow. Potentially ho slightly higher if you're going to a recourse product at like a local bank or something, but you're generally, if you underwrite to 50%, that's probably like a fairly reasonable rule of thumb, um, mm -hmm. for today's market. Um, the second thing I would say is if you do it in all cash, you are going to put a lot of pressure on the asset to perform because mm -hmm. what's going to happen is now, instead of having to just service a million or one and a half million in equity, you now are going to have to service almost 3 million in equity. And so it's like, you will need to have double the cash flow to get the same return to your investors than just leveraging it even at 50%. Uh, is there a reason why you're considering all cash versus leverage? Um, no, I mean, I could, we can, I, I, I'm, I'm actually just trying to figure out what is the best methods. Is it syndication? Is it just taking on the debt, um, putting like a, getting maybe a, a conventional type of loan or, or mm -hmm. maybe a DSCR loan? Mm -hmm. um, does it, is it, is it debt cover? What's the DSCR on it? Oh, well, if we could provide the air DNA data mm -hmm. and show that the property would, would, would cash flow enough, um, I can send you the actual analysis that I did on the LTR and the STR. The, the STR actually cash flows like 20,000 a month, but that's with the 510,000 down, you know, 20% conventional type loan. Okay. Uh, yeah. You're probably not going to get like a 20% down loan in today's market and especially with short-term rentals. So I don't know if mm -hmm. you've done short-term rentals before. No. Okay. Banks hate them. They hate them. They see them as massive amounts of risk. So they're not going to let you leverage it as high. And you said it's in Tempe, right? Mm -hmm. um, there is a guy on Instagram. His name is uh, Sujay Mehta. And his mm -hmm. company is Bloom Ventures, B-L-O-O-M. He is a phenomenal hotel short-term rental operator. Uh, he has a pretty big portfolio. I think he's the right person to help you with it. He's really great with numbers and understanding the capital stack. The problem for single or single family for short-term rentals for me is we just don't do them because they're outside of our wheelhouse and our buy box. I've underwritten mm -hmm. them before. I've looked at buying them before. I always come back to the same conclusion on multi-unit assets, which is I would rather be conservative and buy it if it works as a long-term rental and then try to boost the income and uh -huh. the plan by adding in or making it a short-term rental, but okay. I'd rather rely on the long-term rental because it's more conservative. Uh, you may have a more aggressive appetite for risk than I do though. So it's not saying it's wrong. This people buy boutique hotels all the time. It's just not within our risk tolerance, but um, connect with Sujay. Tell him you and I spoke. He's a really great guy, very smart. Um, and he, he should be able to help you. Thank you so much. I had a, just a quick little 
follow-up question. Okay. Have you heard of the crowdsourcing companies that are that are doing uh, crowdsourcing for for STRs? Uh, I don't know about for STR specifically, but like there's Realty Mogul, CrowdStreet, all of those. Mm -hmm. Is this your first deal? This, yeah. It's going to be very tough to get on those websites. They have like, I've never been on those websites. Now, to be fair, we haven't needed them, but we're just now looking to get on them. And they mm -hmm. put through a rigorous background check. They want track record. They want to see your exits. It's very tough to get on those sites. Um, okay. And it's also your cost of capital is fairly expensive. Mm -hmm. So if this deal only works as a short-term rental and it doesn't work as a long-term rental, I would be considering what, what are the risk mitigation strategies you want to put in place, right? What are the things that you can do to make sure that you don't get upside down or go into foreclosure on the asset? As far mm -hmm. as raising the equity for the deal, if it were me, I on a deal of this size, and it's going to depend on your network. It's going to depend on your investors. But I would be going, you're raising less than $2 million. I would go into a 506B raise, be like boy, mm -hmm. uh, because you don't have as much administrative hurdle of verifying accreditation. You can just ask investors, and that's typically enough uh, to rely on from the SEC perspective. And mm -hmm. then 35 unaccredited but sophisticated investors. So that probably opens the door to some of your friends and family who maybe can't meet those thresholds that want to invest. And, you know, I'm all about giving the little guy an opportunity and getting them into the door. And so mm -hmm. whenever I have an opportunity to, to open that door, I always do because I don't get a chance to do it very often. And I think you're at a point where you probably can. Uh, yeah. But this is also when I, when I said, reach out to your securities attorney, um, or, or at least Nick does this with, even with us and with everybody, he'll ask like, hey, where's the capital coming from? Who are the people you're raising from? Give me a better idea of their avatar so that I can guide you to which regulation is the best way to do it. Stephen Allen, you are on with Vina Jetty. What's your question? Hey, Vina, uh, thank you so much for doing this today. I really okay. appreciate it. Of course. I'm happy to be here. How are you? I'm doing great. Awesome. So um, my question is kind of in a different realm. Um I've been, you kind of answered a little bit earlier, but I was looking at possibly doing a reg CF mm -hmm. for raising private capital for non-accredited investors. Mm -hmm. And I know there's limits to there, like you can't sell your share for after you, until it's been in there for a year. Yep. Um, and you're limited to 5 million per year. Mm -hmm. Is that per entity or to your, to that specific person that's raising the money? So again, I'm not an attorney. Oh yeah, that's fine. Um, limited to the the issuer, the issuing uh, entity. So, okay. for example, if you set up a Reg CF under, let's say, Entity One, that that can only issue five million dollars. And I actually don't know the answer about whether or not you can do a fund two with a new Reg CF with a new registering, new offering. My gut and my instinct says, yes, you can, but you'll have to set it up again. Now, just as like a word of caution when doing a reg CF, there's two things I wanted to share with you on that. First and foremost, the administrative hurdle on a reg CF is incredibly high. It's very expensive. So when you're underwriting it, make sure you're underwriting with enough room for operating expenses or administrative expenses there. So that's one. The second thing I'll say is on a reg CF, you it's going to take you way more time and money to get it set up out of the gate. So it could take you anywhere from six to nine months to get it set up. And it can cost you, I think Pace just started his reg CF this year. And he said he paid, I think he said 150 or 200K to get it started. Okay. By comparison, a reg a reg D 506 B or 506 C at least with my attorney to set that up all in, including all of your hard costs, your filings, your blue sky filings, everything you'll be on like very conservatively. You'd be under like 12 or 13,000. Oh, wow. There's a huge difference there. Massive. And you can have it set up in a month. Right. So the reason I was thinking going this route is because I've see things like um, honey bricks and, and stuff like that, where you actually have to be accredited in order to do that. But I was actually going to tokenize this. So raise private capital for different mm -hmm. 
things that other people were wanting to do. And that was one of my other questions is, do you actually have to have the deal in place in order to raise the money or can I raise the money or find the people, bring it in like, Hey, we've got a deal now. Let's go. Uh, you, your timing won't work if you wait till you have a deal in place. Okay. You, the lead time is just way too long on a reg CF. Um, but with that being said, if you, your plan is to take that money and then invest it into someone else's deal, you need to be really careful because it, I have not found this the way to do that, which doesn't violate securities rules. Okay. So you all, the Reg CF is really a tool to be utilized for your own deal where the Reg CF will sit on title. Okay. So you'd need to have a title, a position in title. So usually that'll be done through a tick or a tenant in common structure. So you would come to me and say, hey, Vina, I have $5 million. I want to be you know, in a tick on 123 Main Street that you're acquiring put me on the org chart and you would have a concurrent but separate security to my security. But the problem with Reg CF is it's limited to $5 million. So for me, I, it's way too expensive and way too much of an, a hurdle for me to add a $5 million check into a tick. I would rather just raise it through our Reg D 506C. So there's a lot of nuance, like a lot, a lot, a lot of nuance. Um, I don't know if you're in my Facebook group, but Nick, who's my securities attorney that I keep mm -hmm. talking about, he's in the group now and I keep bothering him to answer people's messages. So if you put it in there um, or questions, I, if you put it in there, um, he will, I'll make sure he answers it. Makes sense. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Absolutely. I hope that helps. Yep. Steven, thank you so much, but always good to see you. And guys, we have Stephen Allen coming up in uh, a few weeks as our one of our guest speakers. Sean Baxter, you are on with Vina Jetty. What's your question? Hey, Vina. Thanks for all the jams you're dropping. Of course. Good. Hey, I'm signed up to do your challenge next week. And also with Myron and um, two for their group they're doing for putting people to make a team. I love on it. There. Yes. So I've been doing like broker outreach and mm -hmm. like anybody I talk to, it's like, Hey, I'm doing this to set seeds for private money. Mm -hmm. Would you, I haven't ever said how much I'm looking for just because I don't know how that all works. But mm -hmm. with a team, I've noticed that you're usually going to do one thing and not multiple things for the most part. Mm -hmm. Would you stick in like, like because I drive a lot so I'm like I enjoy doing the broker outreach the private mm -hmm. money not so much would mm -hmm. you suggest just staying on one path to jump start that or what's your suggestion with that oh, yeah that's a good question um the the answer is it kind of depends right what are the skill sets your teammates have right do they have all of the other skill sets and they just are missing this piece my experience would tell me if you're like, Hey, I'm only going to do broker at reach and I'm not going to do anything else. There's probably someone else on the GP team or the sponsor team that can add that to whatever eight other tasks they're doing or five other tasks they're doing. Right. So it doesn't have as much value singularly. Now, if you were like, Hey, I'm going to do broker outreach and I'm going to underwrite the deal and I'm going to go find us the deal. Well, then that's a little bit of a different value proposition. So sure. If you found a partner that would be okay with you only doing broker outreach, absolutely. That's, it's a valuable part of the deal. I just, the way I would look at it is your other partners are going to be like, we don't need to give up equity and have another cook in the kitchen just have broker outreach, like we can handle that with, you know, whoever's doing underwriting can do it or whatever that looks like. But there are so many different ways to be involved in these deals. Um, you know, broker outreach is just one. There might be something else you really enjoy that you just don't know yet. Um, after my challenge next week, you'll know pretty quickly if you enjoy the raising capital part. Um, what I will say is anybody who's an entrepreneur, if you want to get to scale, some people don't and that's okay. But if you want to get to scale, you absolutely have to know how to raise capital. And I mean that as a broad statement, not just real estate. If you own franchises or retail businesses or restaurants, or it doesn't matter, you have to know how to raise capital because the fact is, is you're going to end up being able to grow so far. And then you're going to get 
to a point where you can't get any further and you need other people's money or OPM to get there. And so being able to leverage that and knowing how to leverage that is what's really important. So you, I, I always tell people, a lot of people are really uncomfortable raising capital. I was uncomfortable raising capital the first time I did it, but it's easily the most valuable skill set that you will have in multifamily or in any other business that you do. Yeah. And that's where I, I think that finding out what I can do, multiple things I can do, but I like to do everything, but just figuring those key points of what yeah. I'm good at. So. Okay. Yep. I look you don't forward need to, to next week. All, yeah, you don't need to be a jack of all trades and master of none. Right. You can do a couple of things really, really, really well. And that is extremely valuable to a team. So I'm excited to have you next week too. I, I spent a lot of time putting it together. So, and it's actually the first time I'm going to be putting out like a, an actual document of things I've used. I've never shared it with anybody ever. And so it's going to be my first time. So I feel vulnerable doing it, but I'm really excited for you guys to be able to take it and see what you guys do with it. Here you, Alexis Jimenez, you are on with Bina Jetty. What's your question? Hi, Bina. Thank you so much for this time. Of course. So I am a limited partner in a 170 units and a GP in a smaller deal that I funded myself. But listening to you um, make me wonder something. So I'm raising capital for, for our next deal. And I just wanted to, well, can, can you go over again to the regular Regulation C? Uh, mm-hmm. th- this is the one that allows me to advertise the property and raise capital from people that I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Reg D 506C. Uh, let, let me, Re- Reg D? 506C, like Charlie. And I feel like we're getting so many legal questions. Uh, one thing I want to just share too is I actually am working with Nick. And after the investor challenge that we're going to do, we're going to actually do a legal challenge so that you guys can get a little more comfortable with the different rules and regulations and how to lawfully raise capital. That'll be awesome. So, yes. But yeah, All so right. it's Reg D 506C. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And also, if all of you guys listening, if you haven't done a deal yet, this is the person that is one or two deals ahead of you. So that means they are now your experienced partner. So make sure you're reaching out and networking. Rodney Adams, you are on with Vina Jetty. What's your question? Great. Thank you, Vina. Thank you, JJ, for doing this. You guys are both awesome with what you're doing. Of course. So... I see that, Vina, that you're doing like 75 million and up uh, apartment complexes, so multifamily for the most part. So my question is, do you mostly do accredited investors and also like institutional as well? Or are you just all doing accredited investors? Oh, this is a very good question. Okay, so we're we have not taken in a single institutional dollar yet. Uh, We have had offers. And we have negotiated term sheets and we've gotten really, really far. And then we kind of pulled back and said, we don't really want to. Um, So all of our capital is retail capital. We raise entirely from high net worth individuals. Uh, We do have a couple of family offices that routinely invest with us. Um, So they'll write, you know, anywhere from three to $5 million check, but Generally speaking, most of my investors are just high income professionals. Okay. Oh, great. I have a follow up question to that as well. Obviously, with um, small, you know, multifamily, this, the due diligence is a little different, but these bigger deals that you, got, you guys are doing, what is kind of the, some of the first things that you're asking for them to send over to, okay. for you to take a look at it? When you're, underwrite, when you're underwriting the deal? Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, rent roll and T12. That's all I care about out of the gate is I need rent roll or T12 up front. And then I can do a fairly quick analysis. And this will, this is true for any size of deal. It doesn't matter if it's five units or five million units. It's all the same. Um, because you want to be able to look at what has historically happened over the last 12 months. And then you want to be able to see any anomalies like Maybe there was a month where your plumbing bill is 10x what it is on average. And then that indicates to me, hey, wait, what happened in this month? Like, what did, was there a leak? 
Did you replace something? Is that something that should have actually been in your CapEx below the line? Like what happened there? So that's why we look to the T12. And then we use that to make our pro forma, which is our forward looking projection. Um, And then the rent roll is just to verify all of the occupancy and rent numbers and lease assumptions. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Mike Darty, you are on with Vina Jetty. What's your question? Well, um, well, actually, uh, I'm going to be doing my very first deal ever, maybe me my first call ever to a about 130 uh, unit mobile home park. Okay. So doesn't this kind of multi family? Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, it is dilapidated, horrible condition with a million dollar view. It, I'm just going, golly, but I don't, even, I'm like going, I could make this thing fantastic to be a okay. great uh, opportunity, but I don't even know where to start. I love Go the back. ambition. I love the tenacity. Uh, one thing I will say, your first deal, if you're doing it without partners that are significantly more experienced in this specific asset class and business plan, I always like to go for kind of the clean, easier deal. Um, Because the problem is, is you don't know what you don't know yet. And there are some things I can tell you all these things that have happened on our assets. You may or may not have something similar happen. You might have something completely different happen. But what happens is the more and more you see different problems arise and you get over those different hurdles, now I can pivot much quicker, right? So I, if anything that is even remotely like problem A happens, I can pivot on problem B much faster because of the experience, right? So I worry if it's your very first deal, Getting a severely distressed property is much more risk. It's higher risk. And the concern is not actually whether you can do it or not. The concern is is if you don't hold to whatever your investors are expecting, right? You are going to cut yourself off very early from being able to grow and scale. Whereas if you wait and you're a little patient and you get the right deal, and you do five, 10 deals, great. Then go raise on this. And if it doesn't go well, fine. You have a track record that you can point to of your ability to do this. But if you fail on this, or if you lose money on this, then you have a 0% success rate. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I don't want to do that. No. That's why I'm on don't. the Zoom. Right. <laughs> but I'm ready. I'm ready. To, yeah. I, got a, I got about that a million... Is- if I wouldn't be uh, talking to you, I'd be on the phone with, with uh, people right now. <laughs> I love Great. it. Well, thank you for being here. And I think, you know, I, I think it's still worth exploring. I think it's still worth underwriting. Uh, you know, from my perspective, I don't care if there's a $5 million plumbing issue on the property. As long as I know about it ahead of time, I can underwrite for it and plan for it. So I don't, it doesn't bother. You know, this is not even on the market. I just see an opportunity. This place is so dilapidated. These people got to be only about money. Mm-hmm. And they, they don't. I I ran, ran so many uh, thousand medical calls in that no mobile home park. <laughs> so, yeah, anyway, it's just it. going to be a good. You know, I'm going to read. I'm going to take your advice and um and start. I'm building out my my structure right now. Rocket fuel is an un in- oh great book. book. Yeah, changing my life. You also my read life. Traction mm-hmm. and Vivid Vision. All three of those books are books that my mentor like one of my mentors gave me and he runs a significant family office. He's incredible. He's very smart. And he sent me all three of those books. So definitely look at those. Damian Palmer, you are on with Vina Jetty. What's your question? I'm actually um, partnering with an investor right now and we're working on building um, a multifamily unit using container homes. So what's oh. your, what, what do you think about that? So we're actually don't think looking and making and we're talking to the city um, mm-hmm. The city's on board of us doing it. We're actually looking at a facility that he purchased. So um, to actually, we're building out each unit at the facility and then ship it to the site that we're actually going to build it on. Oh, interesting. Um, so I this is definitely not in my wheelhouse. Um, I don't do anything new dev. I don't know where to start. I would need like a really strong 
a development partner if I were to ever move into that space. But so right now we just are not in that space. Um, with that, I think that this is a very interesting concept. Do you know who Alvin Hope Johnson is? I don't. Oh, you should know him. Um, he's a wonderful, amazing human being. Actually, Pace and Alvin and I were all together yesterday and we all got to you know hang out with the VIP mastermind students that Pace had. Um, but find him on Instagram, Alvin Hope Johnson. He responds to his own messages. And okay. I think he's the person that you need because he does new dev. And he also does, um, he uses SIP panels, which I think are actually really incredible. Um, so, you know, I tell him, I'm like, Alvin, go build it and then sell it to me and I'll buy it. So uh, he's just a really great guy. I think he will be able to give you more insight into how to look at the project. I just, I don't want to give you advice and then lead you down the wrong path. That's fine. That's fine. That's not a problem. Yeah. But, you know, to your point, though, I, I love it because, as you said, with multifamily, you know, we we started off doing um re rehabbing first and mm -hmm. we're like, well, let's jump into multifamily because we want to start um, sitting on the beach a little bit more. I love it. I love it. I will tell you, there are very few beaches I sit on without a computer and or my phone on, but... I could, I just don't want to because I like what I do. I love what I do. That's great. So an, another question. So with raising capital for multifamily, because we raise pretty much private capital for all of our single family deals. Mm -hmm. Now when you're raising for multifamily, is it talking to everyone? Are you going to specific venues? Or are you going to different? It's all about networking pretty much, right? When you're raising it for multifamily, especially when you go into those higher um, numbers? Yeah. You know, people invest with who they know, like, and trust. A lot of people start out and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go to all the family offices and I'm going to ask them for a million dollar check on my very first deal. Don't do it. You will waste your time. You will spin your wheels. Family offices. And does everyone know what a family office is? Do you want me to yeah. tell you? you do. Okay. Um, so family offices, they have teams of gatekeepers. These are people that are specifically on this family's payroll just to tell you no and just to vet these deals. You will not get past their gatekeeper if you try, but you can go to high net worth investors. You can go to retail investors. Anybody who's in your network is a potential investor. And you should talk to everybody you talk to from from this moment forward, you don't talk to anybody that's not a potential partner or investor. Everybody, right? Okay. I talk to my I, I talk to my male lady. I talk to her like she's a potential investor. Every single person is a potential investor into your deal. And that was actually a really big mindset shift for me. I had this feeling like, oh my gosh, like I don't want to tell people this. I don't want to be like pushy or being like a salesperson or something trying to raise this capital, right? But now what I realize is I have an opportunity that nobody else has. And I have an obligation to at least tell the people in my world and in my orbit about what I'm doing. If they don't want to invest, that's totally fine. But I have an obligation to say it to them so that they know what I'm doing. Does that make definitely. sense? Yes, definitely. Definitely. Awesome. You got to be very intentional with every conversation that you're having. Every conversation. Yes. Every conversation. Don't be shy about telling people what you're doing, even if you're starting out. You mean, I, I love that comment. Intentional. I say it all the time. Network with intention. Uh, Vina is all about that. Let people know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, Damien, you and I need to catch up, brother. I want to get you on as a guest speaker. We do. We do. I know. We, we, yeah. So, hey, thank you for your question. And uh, let's you and I touch base soon. All right, guys, don't forget, it. whether you're on the call or watching on YouTube, please join Vina's Facebook group, Mastering Multifamily with Vina Jetty. Please join this group. In addition to that, she has a YouTube channel, which we're going to get exploded as well. And this is Multifamily with Vina Jetty. You can find, I'm going to hit subscribe right now. I just hit subscribe. I've subscribed. With that, we're going to bounce back. We have our next question coming in. Eddie Charger, oh my God, it's such an honor to have you on the call, my friend. I've been following you forever. Love you. Um, Eddie Charger, you're on with Vina Jetty. What's your question? 
Man, first, man, Jay, I, got, I definitely got to say thank you for putting this together, bringing this on, and you continue to align yourself with the greats and the superstars. So appreciate that. And, of course, you have the great Vina here. It's amazing. I've been watching you tearing up the road, the streets, the multifamily. Anything <laughs> in front of you, you've just been killing it, and I absolutely appreciate your time. My question is very simple, right? Well, it's a two-part question. One is how do we get deals to be able to send to you and your team? That's the first thing. Just want to make sure I know there's a couple people that came in after. want to make sure we know how to be able to do that. Okay. Um and then the second is with so much change that's going on in the market, people have been hearing a lot of information. Some of it is true. Some of it is not. And I wanted to get it from your point of view. As interest mm -hmm. rates rise, mm -hmm. does that make multifamily not a beneficial investment? Because what we've been hearing is as the interest rates go up, it somehow affects multifamily in a way that doesn't make it its best because the values of properties is going down. So I want to get your take on that. To reach out to me, you can email me a deal, but here's the thing. I say no to pretty much everything I see because it just doesn't fit our buy box. And if it does and it's on market, we already have access to it. So if a broker has touched the deal, if you're not direct to seller, it's highly unlikely that we haven't looked at it yet. Um, and I say that to also say that if you're direct to seller on the deals at the size we're looking at, 99% of the time it's actually with a broker or it's being daisy changed. So I'm I we don't we don't buy from wholesalers really. We would, but I don't see deals at this deal size that are legitimate transacting off market right now or without any broker or without a previous relationship. So with that caveat being said, if it meets all of our criteria and it truly is off market or direct to seller, um, you can email it to me or you can send it. Actually, I check my own Instagram messages. I don't check my own emails. I respond to some of them, but most of them get checked by my admin and filtered. So they'll get filtered out if they don't meet the buy criteria. Um, but you can send me an Instagram message with the deal details and I can tell you if it's something we'd even look at. Perfect. And then your second question. Okay. So it's actually quite the opposite. This is actually the best time to be investing in income producing real estate because of m many reasons. So one, we know what's happening with inflation, right? It's really high. It continues to remain high, including core inflation. Mm -hmm. Income producing real estate is easily the best hedge to inflation because it is a hard asset it will theoretically cash flow and it's not going to lose the value at the the value of the asset's not going to decline at the same rate of inflation right as the same rate as dollars are declining or the buying power of a dollar is declining so that's number 1 uh two when we look to interest rates right there and this is going to depend on your sponsor, but you want a sponsor or a GP or whoever's buying your asset to be looking at the deal with more conservative strategy in mind now. Uh, what does that mean? One, we're looking at longer term debt. We're looking at fixed rate debt. Again, we haven't looked at that in the last two years, maybe three years. Um, we are now leveraging lower, right? If you were here earlier, you heard me say that you probably are getting 50% leverage on assets. So we're going into an asset right now we're underwriting it to 50% leverage. Six months ago, I was leveraging to like 65%, which was low. Six months before that, I was leveraging to 72%, which was low. So we're consistently seeing a decline in how much we are actually leveraging the asset from an LTV or LTC perspective. Um, the other thing I would say is if interest rates are as high as they are, and when we look to the stock market, right? Which is generally going to be the other vehicle people are looking at stock market or real estate of some sort. The stock market is not outperforming multifamily. It's not outperforming real estate. Uh, real estate is not nearly as volatile as the stock market is despite rising interest rates. The other thing to remember too is interest rates, if they come back down, then we can relever the deal. We can refinance the deal, but it's all about how you underwrite it in the beginning. If you underwrite it with the interest rate environment in mind and the numbers still work, then it shouldn't really be an issue. And the last and the biggest reason why multifamily this, this year, actually 2022 is the best year to be investing in multifamily because 
of the tax efficiency of this investment. You can get the benefits of depreciation even as a limited partner in the deal. And what happens in 2023 is that 100% bonus depreciation that we have today and we've had for these last few years, that goes down to 80% next year. And then the following year, it goes down to 60, then 40, and eventually phases out. So it is worthwhile this year, if you're thinking about investing into a deal in this year or in January of next year, it is worthwhile to try to get into it before the end of this year, before December 31st. So there, you know, everybody's going to have a different perspective on it. Multifamily historically has outperformed every single asset class over the last like 30 something years. If you look to what's called a sharp ratio um, and a sharp ratio takes into account the amount of risk you have to take on relative to the amount of war- reward you take on, right? So if you take on a whole bunch of risk and get a 20% return, and then you take on no risk and get a 20% return, the second deal is going to have a higher sharp ratio because it's going to be more standard deviations away from the median. Okay. If you look at the sharp ratio of all these different asset classes, multifamily blows everything else out of the water. It's the best return you can get for the least amount of relative risk. Love that. So hopefully that helps. Yeah, big time. Makes perfect sense. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Thanks, Eddie. TJ Kramins, you are on with Vina Jetty. What's your question? Hey, thanks, JJ. I wouldn't miss this call with the flu or otherwise. So, hey, Vina. um, TJ. How are you? Um, hey, so when I'm I'm in the process right now of raising um, 20 million for a Reg C fund, that we're finding difficulties in dealing with um, or bringing in investors because they want to see a per deal basis. So we're trying to restructure that now to where instead of it being a 20 million cap raise, we're going to do it on a per deal structure. Um, can you walk us through maybe a little bit of what you look for metrics on a deal, what your prefs are, what your waterfall is, um, you know, and what, you know, what uh, IRR and all that you're hitting on these deals? Yeah. When you're saying a reg C, I just want to clarify, you mean you're raising Sorry. on a reg D 506 C? Correct. Yes. Sorry, ma'am. Okay, perfect. I just want to make sure because I was like, I don't know what a rig. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. Yes. This I can help with. Um, so on our deals, we actually target the same returns. And if it doesn't underwrite, we actually don't go after it. So right now we're seeing on class B value add multifamily, large class B value add multifamily in our markets, which are growth markets are high population high. They're, they're really primary markets, maybe maybe like between primary and secondary markets because it's in the general MSA, but we're seeing 11 to uh, no, actually 12 to 15% IRR. Sometimes we'll see a deal that underwrites at 11, 11 and a half percent IRR, but it cash flows really well. So we can kind of mitigate some of the lower IRR return. Um, cash on cash is really, really, really tough right now because debt is so low. I'm sorry, leverage is so low that your debt payment is your debt payment is eating a part of the cash flow but then the remainder is being sent to your equity and with the equity payment being so high your cash on cash is going to drop because you have to service more equity and equity is more expensive so right now i would say in year 1 especially on value add where you're repositioning um you should be seeing probably anywhere from well, actually, I know some operators that are seeing 0% in year one. Um, we're, we go after deals where we can see at least 4.5-ish, 4%, 5% on average. So I would say like anywhere from 0 to 5% is probably standard for cash on cash during the hold period. Your average annualized return that you're going to see is probably going to be around, our, on our deals, it's 14 to 16%. And our equity multiple, anywhere from 1.4 to 1.7 is probably pretty standard right now. Love it. Thank you. You are the queen. I appreciate what you do. Oh, I appreciate you. And thank you. And I know you always participate in my group. So I appreciate you. I got you. Thank you. Tony Spencer, you're on with Vina Jetty. What's your question? Hey, Vina, how are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. How are you? Hey, I'll, I'll just try and make it kind of quick. So sure. you mentioned that you, um, you pass up about 99% of the deals that come across your desk. So that tells me that you've got probably kind of a quick and dirty way to shuffle out the ones you're not interested in. Could you could you go over how you do that and, and maybe do it in kind of more of a of a generic sense that would apply to somebody that's uh, just getting started? 
Yeah. So I have a buy box and I recommend anybody has a buy box and you write it down. It's going to be, for me, it's class B value add multifamily, Texas, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Arizona. And then even within that, I know my specific buy markets. So for example, in Texas, we'll buy in Dallas, we'll buy in Austin, we aren't really looking at Houston right now, for example. So um, have your markets ready. Know how many units you want. I want only 200 plus units. I want 1990s vintage or newer. I want to have the purchase price is probably going to be 75 million and up. Maybe it'll be slightly lower, but generally I know that it's going to price out if it's an asset we would buy. And I get deals all the time from people that are like, oh, I have this new development deal in Albuquerque and it's $15 million. Do you want to buy it? No, <laughs> it's not in my buy box. I can't buy it. I don't know what to do with it. I can't underwrite it efficiently. I can't manage it efficiently. I'm not the right partner for you. Um, so I'm very quick to say no on things that don't check those boxes. If it checks those boxes, then my next question is, is it off market or is it on market? It's on market. We're already underwriting it. It's don't send me your underwriting. Don't send me your deal metrics. Cause we're probably potentially competing on it. Um, or we said no already for some other reason. And then if it is off market and it meets all those criteria, then we'll take a deeper dive. We'll do a back of the envelope analysis, and then we'll do a full underwriting if the back of the envelope is green. For somebody who doesn't have a buy box. Yeah, you're going to make one. I just told you how to make one. So you're going to make one, right? So you're going to decide as narrow as possible what markets you want to be in, what asset class, what business plan. Uh, We're going to decide what year of construction, what's your price range that you're looking in. And you're only going to look at deals. Like someone might give you the best deal you've ever seen in your whole entire life in Montana. And if that's not in your buy box, it does not matter. Damien, you are on with Vina Jetty. What's your question? Hey, want to say thanks, Vina and uh, JJ. Thanks a lot. My question is all about track records. So I just got burned on a track record. So a friend, investor friend of mine had a, had a flip going on. And um, they had the chance to go 100% financing. I'm like, okay, you, you can use my track record, like a sponsor. They're like, you haven't done any flips, right? Because all my track record is mostly like buy and hold. I have yeah. lending. I'm a real estate broker. So my question is getting the, the doing the, the um, track record and getting started in, um, in multifamily, right? Do you think syndication, is syndication good for, And being a limited partner in someone else's deal that's doing a syndication, is that a good way to get started? Like I had an opportunity recently um, to get in with um, um, these guys here locally in New Jersey, Joey Chan and um, and Jonathan. um, But I, I, I didn't I didn't stick my foot out. But. You know, you, 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 what they were presenting was like they're actually like, you know, going through the deal. We get updates and everything like that. Um, is that is that good? A good um, a good thing to do to build your track record in multifamily. What is what is your thoughts and just in general on on building track records in general? Yeah, it definitely doesn't hurt. I have a lot of investors that come in as LPs into my deal and they start there and then they graduate into whatever they're moving on to next and they utilize this as part of their SREO, their schedule of real estate owned. So it's definitely worthwhile to consider. It's not the only way, but it definitely does not hurt to do that. The bigger thing that you get from it, other than just track record, is you get process. So if you invest with a really great sponsor, they're going to have a really great process that you can follow. You can say, okay, every 28th of the month, Vina is sending me an update. These are the 10 things she puts in it every single time. Okay, every quarter, she's sending me financials. Here's what that looks like. Here's how she's communicating about issues. Okay, something isn't going right, and now she's increased her communication. So you can see the process that we have to communicate with our investors, and you can utilize and adapt that process for your investors when you're raising capital. That's what I think the most valuable thing you get out of being an LP is. The second most valuable thing is having the ability to say that you co-own the property because you're an equity investor, unless you're investing in debt. But if you're investing in equity, you own part of the property. You are a partner on 
a hundred million dollar asset or whatever, whatever that looks like. So yes, I think it's definitely worthwhile looking at. Does it mean it's definitely going to make you bankable? Absolutely not, but it does not hurt. And it does help. It's about a story, right? It's a picture that you're painting for the bank because what you're trying to do is you're trying to remove risk from the bank. Mm-hmm. And so by having that and having that, even that track record as an LP, it shows that you understand how to evaluate investments. You understand how they work, what they are. You're seeing them on a monthly, weekly, daily, whatever basis. And that is absolutely helpful to building your experience and the story of what the lender is going to look at when they're make, when they're seeing if they're going to give you a loan or not. Damien, thanks for joining us. Hey, good to see you again, my friend. Good to see you as well. You know, I, I got one last question for you, and we yeah. kind of touched on this at the beginning of the call, and I'll be a little bit more specific. Um, how important is networking to our business? And uh, what's the importance for the new or the seasoned investor who's not yet networking of joining a group like mine? I'll say my group in particular, because I want everybody to join my group. What is the value, you think, of being in part of a group where we're offering this kind of a content, quality content, and everything else? Oh, I can't put a price on that. I It could be worth millions of dollars or billions of dollars if you actually utilize it the way that you've curated it. I will say that the amount of care and the amount of thought you put behind curating this space for your community is very apparent and very clear. And what happens is now you're in a high quality group and I mean, like I said, I did not see the value in masterminds or group coaching or mentorships or any of that when I first started. And until like last year, I think is when I kind of was like, maybe there's something to this. And then, like I said, I got into this, like these friend circles where I'm like the poor friend and every single one of them is in a coaching a mastermind, a mentorship of some sort. And I was like, huh, maybe they know something that I don't know and I am willing to be wrong. And so now I have started recognizing and realizing the fruits of just, not just networking, but building relationships and being around incredible connectors who care about the people that they are connecting. Like JJ, one of the things I think you do absolutely phenomenally is you, you're not just frivolously doing this. You're not doing this recklessly. You're intentional about it, right? We said that word earlier and the intentionality shows, the care shows. And I think that that actually creates better results than just having a networking group that people join and there's no vetting process. There's no there's no leader to kind of help be a sieve for the tire kickers. Cause that's just a waste of all of our time. We want people who are going to be valuable to us that we can help and be valuable to them. We want the people that are going to push us to be the best we can be. We want the people that are going to show us that things are possible that we would have never have dreamed of on our own. That's who we want to be around. We want to be around those like-minded individuals. And we say like-minded, which I was not like-minded like my friend circle when I joined that friend circle. I am now because they they would not have me around if I didn't join and agree with what their mentality and their mindset is because they want success. They want other people who want that same success. And they wouldn't keep me around if I didn't do that. And so I'm very grateful that I had somebody like JJ who put me into a position and at that, at the moment I deserved to understand what the power of these groups really are. And so thank you, JJ, for everything you do for everybody. I absolutely adore this group. I adore you. I think you are just so giving and selfless. And I think you're helping so many people and you, you maybe don't even realize the impact of what you're doing yet because everybody in here hasn't even reached their full potential yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank, thank you so much. You know, it's kind of crazy. I'm, I'm really humbled. Um, I mean, every, every time I think that I'm not reaching anybody and that I should stop the calls and stop the group, I get a text message. I get a phone call of people telling me how I'm helping them. And it just, um, it brings me to tears sometimes on all honesty, you know, um, 
I value my relationships. You guys on the call, you're watching on YouTube. I value my relationships more than anything because that's the core of what I do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to have someone on the call like Eddie Charger, oh my gosh. I mean, this guy is an inspiration. If you guys are in step two, you know his name. And now we're, we're honored to have him on this call. And this is the beginning, ideally, of me getting to know him better. But if you guys aren't being visible, you know, you're, you're cutting off your opportunity to meet people. Mm-hmm. and don't hesitate i just walked right up to me and she didn't know who i was i said <laughs> i gotta meet you i gotta meet you so again thank you so much for being here thank you um, I appreciate for those of you that are on the call thank you again hang on we're gonna go to breakout rooms please don't leave if you're watching this on youtube right now please like the video please like venus presentation please put comments in that's going to help her videos can help the youtube channel again you can you can find me on facebook jj is easy and look for my networking group we have a website networking with jj.com the website group is jj's mastermind networking please reach out to me send me a, a friend request send me a facebook message to introduce yourself never send a face friend request without sending a message to introduce yourself with your number so people can connect with you uh vina thank you so much we're gonna we're thank gonna you. lose you in a couple minutes but again thank you so much for everything you do and and i will be following up with you as soon as you're available Awesome. That sounds great. Like I said, I'm traveling all day today, but I am back feet on the ground late tonight. So let's connect in the next couple of days. And thank you everybody for letting me speak. I know I'm taking, you know, hours out of your Wednesday in the middle of a day and all you guys stayed here with me. I appreciate you. I'm totally humbled. And I hope to see you guys on Monday in my investor challenge. You guys, thank you so much. On behalf of Vina and myself, thanks for joining us. Please look for more videos coming up. Please join my group reach out to me. Let's build our network. Let's kill it. Let's just knock it out of the park. Thank you.